Hello, Jan. Hi. I think Margaret's joining too. There you are. Here I am. So we're good to go, are we? I think so. Do you want to maybe try sharing? Or okay. do you want me to share just to make sure that's okay? Sorry, my, my nose is running. Oh, there you go. There it is. Perfect. My, my comments show and everything. Okay, I'll yeah. stop sharing now for a minute. Technology is a good thing and when it works, right? Yes. Well, we, we wouldn't be doing these workshops if we right. didn't have this way to get together. Right. You sure are a busy woman. But today seems to be one of those days, you know, every once in a while there's a Saturday that everybody plans things on. Actually, the event that I was on earlier today, one of the people I was talking to said, this is the Friday is Thursday, I know. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I'm going to use that, I think. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to stick, keep up with people in the waiting room. I probably should have just made it mint, just let it, let them come in, but. Well, if we would have had some issue to work out, it, it would have been better to be just us. True. Hi, Estella. I'm trying some new tea tonight. <clears throat> no caffeine, peach, something or other. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Warm. Hmm. I like uh, fava tea. Have you ever tried that? I have not. They're in, I think they're in app, they have locations in Appleton and Milwaukee. But it's the best loose tea ever. Really? Thank you for all of your patience today with me. No, it's fine. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> it's fine. I bet you thought if I get one more email from that woman. <laughs> Let's be clear. No, I did not think that. <laughs> well, I didn't know I hadn't registered and I'd sent you my poems. And so I thought, you know, I was home free and then bingo. <laughs> Is it all women on this call? Uh, right now it is, yes. Okay, oh, I was just wondering in total. <laughs> Char Charles Trimberger was part of the first session. I'm not going to be coming tonight. Okay. He said he was going to send me a poem, but then he never did. Oh. I remember a poem with a man's name on it. Did you? Stephen. Because I kept saying, she when I needed a pronoun and then I thought oh wait a minute oh you're right Stephen you're right Stephen 
You're right, you're right, you're right. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hello. You join a deathly quiet. Uh, yeah, what is this? <laughs> she was really talkative. Yeah, no, we were just kind of waiting for people to come in so we can. Estella, I didn't miss a poem from you, did I? No, I, I just, I'm in Marilyn Taylor's workshop this week, and we were out in the Pacific Northwest for two weeks, so. Um, I'm just going to absorb. <laughs> That'll how's feel Marilyn, good. How's Marilyn's workshop this week? Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's also on protest poetry, um, but we're taking the road of um, thinking about witnessing. So from Carolyn Forche. Mm. Wow. I'm, I'm just um, taking this moment to read over the poems <laughs> on my little phone here for tonight. I'm thinking at least the poets who contributed will be on tonight. I think I see Christy, I see Macy, I see Joe, I don't see Sarah yet. Or the two Lucys, I don't think. Although I think one was gonna be on this phone number, maybe. That's me, Joe Shader. Oh, that's you, okay. Estella, you have the most stunning white. Oh, <laughs> oh golly. <laughs> well, I'm good. There's, I'm glad there's something good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks good. It's so funny seeing people have decided to let, <laughs> just let things be what they are or, you know, all those kind of decisions, right? Yeah. Yeah, I made that decision back in um, what it would it have been a nineteen, I don't know, about sixty eight, I think. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Haven't changed it. <laughs> I have green eyes, and I try to tell people that I'm kind of like a birch tree, you know. Everything. <laughs> Hi, Marianne. What you see is Hi, what you get. Is exactly <laughs> what I kept saying to people. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Margaret, my clock says seven. I don't know what yours says. It does. I'm with you on seven. Okay, so I'm not going to introduce you. I think everybody knows you by now. So if you just want to launch into things, that's great. And I will do my best to capture chat. Okay, good. Thank, thanks so much, Tori. And thank you for all the organizing that, that you do in the quick way that you respond to emails. Um, I was among the people who felt like I was over emailing you. Um, and I always got really, really calm and kind replies. So um, I appreciate that very much. Um, and I want to thank everybody for uh, being here tonight. Uh, thank you for the wonderful poems that you sent. Uh, it was a joy to read them all. Um, 
And I, I just thought there was so much good stuff there. Um, so what we, what we planned to do was that um, we'll go through the poems in the order that uh, Tori put them together. Um, it will mean some jumping from one consideration to another, from looking at sound effects in one poem to talking about a conclusion in another poem. Um, or whatever the poet wants to talk about. And I do want to make that point as, as we are going to be watching the clock carefully uh, so that the people who are um, later in the list will not be shortchanged. Um, I will say something and you will see my comments. I typed it, I did add comment and you can see them when we call up the document. Um, I will say some things about the poem. And then in it, I would like the poet who wrote it, uh, if you have some particular thing that you want people to pay attention to or a question that you'd like addressed, I want to give you a minute to say that so we can direct comments that way. Um, and, and then after about three minutes per poem, uh, we'll have another minute where you can add your comments in the chat. I think with so many talented people here, so many approaches to poetry, um, especially this kind of poetry, uh, getting a variety of responses is going to be really important. <clears throat> I think I'm a good reader, but I am one reader. Uh, and I, in no case did I spend as much time on your poem, even though I read and reread them, um, as you spent on it. So, um, so we want this variety of perspectives. Okay, um, I will share my screen. At least I think I will. Oh, here we are. So the first poem on the list is um, this. Let me see if I can scroll down and get the writer's name. Christy Schwan, this is your yes. poem. Mm -hmm. um, I really loved all the play, lot, play with the word line. Um, I was fascinated by how many ways we do talk about lines. Um, lots of examples from very familiar everyday kind of speech. Um, and I think the array of examples that is here makes the point that is in your first line. Dividing lines are drawn faster than any pistol. And then boom, 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 we get all these examples of lines being, being drawn. So that really works very well. Um, I was also intrigued by the fact that you drew a line in the, in the poem um, and had some thoughts about that. Uh, but let me give you a chance to see if there's something that you'd like particular attention on here. You know, the question that I had was, uh, as I started writing this, uh, there were just more and more examples that came to mind, some of which I realized are, are cliches, but they are cliches that actually mean some, that were meaningful to me. So I actually um, wanted to know if that was, you know, usually you hear do not, do not include cliches in your writing, but I wanted to address that specifically. So is that Okay, I guess is my question. I did not think that was a problem at, at all. Uh, there's difference between using a cliche as if you don't know that it's a cliche, uh, kind of an inadvertent <laughs> cliche use, but, but your first line makes the point that we use these line phrases all the time. So they fit in the framework that you provide for them. Um, if there was anything that, that I um, wanted to tinker with or 
uh, wonder about, you do draw this line um, at this point. And at first I thought, okay, this is the line between problem and solution because this ends with bodies outlined on the pavement. And then in this, in below the line is where we erase lines, realign, um, which works as a good conclusion, but, but it, it, if it is problem and solution and it might be something else, then I, I, the, the fault line cracking us open was something that I pondered about. Um, the us indicates that it's a larger than personal cracking open that happens. Um, but if, if there's an earthquake, if the fault line opens, then we're more divided. So, so I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. Um, so those those are my comments. There's, I, I, this, this, you know, this was the first poem I read, and it was a poem that said, "Wow, I'm in for a treat." Um, we want. So we, do we want to have Christy read her poem? Oh, I'm sorry. I do. Thank you, Tori. <laughs> okay, I will do that. Drawn. Dividing lines are drawn faster than any pistol. Blue and red, brown and white, black and blue, rainbow hues, hiding behind our implicit complicit masks, revealing only our worry-lined foreheads. We line up for testing and voting and groceries and vaccines ad infinitum, ad nauseum as virus graphs, graph lines shoot skyward. Headlines feed us filtered fact or fiction. Are everyone's pants on fire? Is there more than one true plumb line or will gravity fail us too? Are some born above the line? Are some born below? Always walking a fine line, wary of accursed, unloosed clotheslines, watching the game from the sidelines, afraid to jump the line, get out of line, cross the invisible out of bounds line, two free foul shots for the other team in the line of duty, bodies outlined on pavement. Where is the fault line that will crack us open? Where everyone can color freely outside the lines, where no one picks anyone out of a lineup, where the line of questioning ends, where we erase lines, realign. Christy, you're worried about cliches, but they're all fresh. They just gave new meaning to what was kind of hacked before. Thank you. So why don't we take a minute to add comments, whatever comments you have for um, Christy in the chat. Sorry. Do I have to stop sharing for the chat to show? No. I will just say that I will be sharing the version with Margaret's comments with everybody also after the workshop. Andrew, you're up next. Um, and will you please read your poem for us?
Mm -hmm. Angie, you have to unmute yourself. So oh, sorry. No need bread, no need. Mix salt, flour, water, and yeast together in a bowl. Use both white, whole wheat and white flour, no white supremacy. Cover with a towel and let the dough sit overnight. Cover your mouth and nose with a mask. Sit-ins, marches, protests, rallies. It will rise on its own. So much is rising, temperatures, tempers. Greed, gun violence, COVID death rates, inequalities. We must rise from the bottom up, the edges, the outside. In the morning, preheat the cast iron pot in a 450 degree oven. The earth is overheating. Droughts are the norm, fires are burning everywhere. No need to punch the dough down for a second rise. No need to push others down. We can all stand at the same time. Line the pot with parchment paper and drop in, in the dough. Line the streets, get in line for a shot, stay in line to vote, drop to your knees in protest and prayer. Bake for 30 minutes with the cover on. Take the cover off and bake for 15 more minutes. Uncover falsets, uncover the truth of what happened. Cool and serve. Cold hearts won't serve anyone but themselves. He gave us bread, we need to do the same. Serve whoever is in need. Mm -hmm. Ooh. One of the things about writing this kind of poem, poem with political um, implications, is one thing that people sometimes object to about such poems is that they seem um, preachy or they seem like uh, they're giving commands. And what I love about your poem is that you begin with a recipe uh, and a recipe is giving directions. So you put us immediately in that mode where this is the way the genre works. Um, and and uh, so it's not something imposed beyond uh, the format that you're using. It grows out of the format that you're using. Um, the, among my favorite ways that you transition from from talking about the baking bread to talking about the social issues is in this third stanza, it will rise on its own. So much is rising. There just is such a smooth flow be, from the talk about the bread to the talk about other things. Um, and where you use word repetition is another place where I think that works very well. No need to punch the dough down, no need to push others down. Uh, word repetition um, links those in, in a very nice way. And you do it again um, in the next stanza with the line and the line. Um, I also do want to comment on the ending. I'm assuming that the he who gives us bread, uh, it could be any he, I suppose, but I took it to be um, Jesus. Uh, it took it to be a religious reference, um, and I, I wasn't expecting it, but it's, it's very gentle and kind in the way it's inserted uh, and not overly obvious, uh, so I think it works, um, and, um, and then when I looked back at the poem, I noticed that before you get to that and then you do talk about knees and prayer. Uh, and so you do kind of prepare us for it, but it's subtle, but, but, but it's there. Did you have something you'd like people to pay attention to? No, I just, it was more a train of thought, you know, when I was doing the recipe and then just what came to mind as I was writing the recipe out. So I didn't know if it felt disjointed, if it, if it was just a little bit too unflowy. <laughs> okay, well, maybe others will like to comment on, on the parts that they think flow especially well and on any that they um, think could be made a little smoother 
in, in this time that we have for, for commenting on your poem. So the chat is open. There is this point in the uh, chat that I would, uh, reminds me of something that, that I wanted to say at some point here. Um, and that is um, whatever pattern is set up in the beginning clues the reader into what to expect from there on. Uh, so someone made the point about the white supremacy tells her right away that you're going to be making leaps. Um, and so when you establish the, a pattern in the beginning, it's easier for the reader to follow. Thank you. And moving right along here, Mary Ann, it is your turn. Will you read for us? Uh, this is Four Leaf Entitlement, and I have a little epigraph. 81% of shots that have gone into arms worldwide have been administered in high and upper middle income countries. Only 0.4% of doses have been administered in low income countries. Uh, this is from tracking coronavirus vaccinations across the world from the New York Times, September 3rd, 2021. This glorious start of day full of bird song, a four leaf clover picks itself straight into my hands. Down the trail a stranger's bones and tufts of fur float and sit among tiny flea bane, almost daisies. Only ghost breath now on a morning she never got to love. Thank you. One of the things that I really loved about this whole series of poems was how many different styles there were. And this poem is a much is much more subtle in its approach than um, some of the others. Um, I was intrigued by the relationship between the epigraph and the poem. Um, there is a, a, a leap there, if you will. Um, that offers a lot of opportunity to, uh, to consider how, it, um, how the relationship works. Um, but it, one of the things that it does is place this glorious day and this walk uh, in, term, in um, the COVID experience in the pandemic, time of the pandemic. Uh, so that from the beginning of the poem, I, I sense a uh, tension between the glorious day and the fact of the, of the pandemic. Um, and it makes the, the bird song and the luck of finding the clover or the clover finding you, finding the speaker, um, take on an extra emotional dimension. I also love the fact that the four leaf clover picks itself straight into my hands. Um, so there's this element of chance of not, not I am lucky because I found the clover, 
but the clover found me. And so there is luck um, sort of bestowed on me rather than I am the origin of this, this, this luck. Um, and then the poem takes this um, turn, which the uh, epigraph also does that go from people who have the good fortune, the luck, uh, to someone who doesn't. What would you like to say, Marianne? I wonder what would happen if I didn't have the epigraph. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, would the entitlement title make it clear enough what I was trying to kind of get across? I don't know. Without the epigraph, would that right. be clear enough? Yeah. Anybody have ideas? I don't think so. I think the epigraph is the setup. And you told us, did you tell us last time about your being a, a four-leaf clover finder that you easily find them? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I remember that. And 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 so when you when you had this about the four-leaf clover picking, because you said you, you just look down and there they are. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, no, I don't think it, I think it works partly because of the epigram. Mm -hmm. So uh, why don't, um, why doesn't everybody uh, use the chat to offer Marianne some feedback? Uh, and if you want to address her particular question, it's a, it's a good one. I think the word entitlement helps even minus the, um, the epigraph, uh, but there's such a parallel of, of structure between the epigraph and the poem that I like keeping. So that's that's my two cents worth. Mine too, actually. <laughs> I wanted to find something that would fit into that thought about um, who gets entitled. So, and it isn't just ourselves being special that we get to be entitled. You did. Can't hear you, Margaret. Uh. Well, right now I'm not saying anything. I'm wondering if the poet is here to read the poem. Is the telephone number R.B. Simon? You need to unmute if you are. I think the phone number is, is again me, Joe Shader. I'm sorry? Well, 
phone number is 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 not the the poet. Oh, okay. Um, so the poet is not here. No, no, it's uh, Renee or RB, and and I don't see either. Okay. Location. I'm in my second story office on the middle class liberal side of Madison, east of the Isthmus in Wisconsin's Driftless region. Across the ocean in the desert, people drop to their death from the wings of planes trying to escape the war zone. Crouched over my desk, I'm stuck in my pounding head, worn and fuzzy from a long day of college classes. Girls in hijabs trek the long drive miles to the local school are stopped and barred at the door from entering. I'm squinting at the computer screen over my bifocals, already into the next week of psychology homework. The young girl is negotiated for by her father who signs the marriage contract. The groom is asked three times if he accepts her. I'm nearing the edge of 50, steps slowing while the rest of the world rushes by my peripheral vision. The elderly widows are hidden in their houses, sweltering in burqa, knobby fingers working in worry, unwanted. I close my computer, deciding I'm too weary for homework. I turn off the lights, lock the door, head up to bed. In the middle of the night, the Taliban begins a door-to-door -door search for collaborators, their family and friends, mass executions. Are expected. I think this poet used the image of the people um, dropping to their death from the wings of planes last time when we were just doing a little impromptu uh, writing, and, and I remember how startling that was. And these are the kinds of details that sometimes get dropped from history and putting them into poems is a way of saying, yes, I remember. Um, and this is to be remembered. How desperate must you be to be in that kind of situation? Um, here the first switch from the location, this poet embeds the social justice issue very clearly in where uh, she is. Um, and the first transition from that location to the issue she's concerned about is signaled very clearly with across the ocean in the desert. And then thereafter, um, not so much, but then, then I think because the pattern's been established, we can move on and understand where everything is is coming from. Door to door, the third last line struck me as being a, a specific detail that was worth emphasizing. And, and so I make this suggestion that maybe it could be the last words of the poem and I, um, suggest one way to do that. I, this is something that I do. And every time I do it, every time I suggest a sentence, I question myself about whether I should go that far in commenting on a poem, because then once I've suggested that, then the poets often feel like, OK, I get your idea, but now I have to think of some way to say it besides the way you said it, because I don't want to say it just the way you said it. So, so if I made a suggestion about how to reword something on your poem and it is, uh, puts you in that kind of quandary, then just erase it and go with what, what you want to do. But I thought the door to door here um, in a search for collaborators, for friends and family, the Taliban goes door to door. Uh, and I don't even think you need the last line. Mm -hmm. um, 
So how about some chat comments on this poem? And then Macy? Um, yeah, I'm here. I can't Good. see the top of the however. <laughs> oh, I, I can I can fix that. Is that better? Yes. Lost lab. A stray he begged with soft brown eyes, bottomless, dark and round like those of an Afghani child being handed above the crowd, overwhelming the Kabul airport, beseeching someone, anyone to take him. I didn't give in. I didn't feed him because then he would stay forever. But he was still there the next morning, staring in the front door while my pup wolf wolfed food. What, what can we do with refugees who come with nothing, hungry? Something had to be done. The sheriff's deputies said they'd try to find room in a shelter, but shelters here are already overrun. Just like those at the border. We would build more if we wanted them to stay. It's a matter of need, not politics. He looked back at me with those eyes that breaks hearts, then changed allegiance, like children staring through confined cages at the border. The deputies fed him, found he had a chip, an easy fix, he was reunited. Still, he was lost four days. I am sorry I did not feed him. Okay, when you do this alternating <laughs> style, as many of the poems do, there is that question of, uh, you know, how does the movement from one consideration to another consideration work? Is it too jarring? Is it smooth enough? Is it okay? Again, if you establish the pattern in the beginning, readers can follow it. Um, and here the pattern is established very well um, because the eyes are the linking device. The uh, dog's eyes and the child's eyes. Uh, and, and then another detail that must be remembered, this fact of somebody being desperate enough to hand their child over, not knowing what that will mean for the future, whether they ever get together again. Um, I'm struck by the fact that um, in the second stanza, most of the poem is a first person singular speaker. I did this, I didn't do that. Um, but at the end of the second stanza, that becomes first person plural. What can we do with refugees who come with nothing hungry? Um, and that shift, uh, is something that I think we could talk about at length. Um, if we had time, it makes me, my reaction was that I, I wanted maybe another statement to help make that transition from first person to singular to first person plural. Um, or maybe if it came later in the poem, um, after the I had said more, uh, from a personal perspective before broadening it out. 
Um, and th that that was one of the questions that I that I had here. And the other one was the the dog turns the finding the dog's owner and his place it turns out to be an easy fix. Um, nothing said about the fix of the problem created by the chaos in Afghanistan. And maybe the silence says it all. Um, the other interesting thing to me about the ending was, I'm sorry I did not feed him. I think a lot of times uh, making the admission of guilt, of being sorry is a difficult thing for people to do. Um, and, and I found that uh, very moving here. Uh, and again, the comparison to the Afghan situation for which you are not responsible uh, in that same direct sort of way is not commented on. And, and again, I, because it was commented on through the other stanzas, I wonder if the silence is what's doing the speaking here. Did you have something you wanted us to pay attention to? You have to unmute yourself. Macy, unmute yourself. Okay, I, I, I said, I, I was trying to listen to what you were saying. It was coming in kind of muddled. I don't know if it, that's on my end, uh, my computer or not. Um, and, and I guess you were saying about something about the guilt at the end. I, could you repeat that? Because I didn't catch what you were trying to say about that. Okay, well, I, I think it's interesting that the guilt comes in as a subject, uh, as part of the content of the poem, because I think that sometimes people shy away from issues that make them feel guilty because they don't want to feel guilty. So I, I, that's a brave move, I think. Um, can you, are you hearing me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, because you, you don't say anything about the Afghanistan situation in the ending, I'm wondering if you intend for silence to do your talking here. Well, you said, am I intending for silence to do the talking or science? S-I-L-E-N-C-E? -E? Oh, yes. S-I-L-E-N-C-E, -E, silence. Okay. Yes. Um, I... Um, I was, you know, I was hoping that that the inference would be there, um, and um, you know, of of what we could do and we we don't, I guess, as I'm in saying, I certainly don't want to, you know, come out and say that in the poem. So, um, and then I guess a question that I had about it, I had initially the line, it's a matter of need, not politics. I had that down in the last stanza initially where he um, looked back at me with those eyes that break heart, then changed allegiance, like the children staring through confined cages at the border. It's a matter of need, not politics. talking about the changed allegiances. But um, that moved it up to the third paragraph, third stanza. OK, so those are some concerns, some points about the poem. Uh, please do add your comments on those points or whatever else you would like to um, say in the chat before we move on.
Annette. Okay. All right. Um, this is called Carrying Water. Hidden behind bushes by a big front porch, my rain barrel is fed by gray gutters funneling rain. I fill two watering cans at two gallons each, carrying heavy, heavy water across my yard for tomatoes, eggplants, squash, chilies. My back hurts, my shoulders burn. I think of people in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, walking miles for water. Barefooted, they seek water, fill and carry every day. Water to drink, to cook, to dare not spill. I fill one for each hand to even out the load, lift with my knees to protect my back, 32 pounds pulling on my arms. How do they carry enough to survive? Handles from the cans cut through my fingers. The tomatoes are thirsty. I cannot satisfy them. 32 pounds, eight more trips. Summer moves forward, hot, dry. The garden is dull as dust, dry as discarded bones, dry as a hard sponge. It craves water. The barrel, nearly empty, needs rain. I prioritize vegetables first, then flowers. I think about those who walk miles for water, their houses, maybe huts have no downspouts to channel water into a barrel. I read they balance urns on either end of a bamboo pole slung across strong shoulders. By chance, by birth, I live in an easier place. I choose not to use the faucet and hose. I use what nature provides in the barrel as if carrying compassion for people who labor around the world just for water. One of the things that I wanted to point out here is that um, there are alternatives to a steady pattern of two lines about this, two lines about the comparable situation, two and two and two and two, or stanza this and stanza that, because here you have several stanzas in a row um, a, um, through the middle of the poem that are all things that are going on with, with you. So it doesn't have to be that one for one kind of um, switch off. Uh, and I think that's, that's a good um, pattern to add to our repertoire of what you can do. The other thing that I wanted to say is that even no matter how important the content is to you, you do want to pay attention to uh, the poetry of what you are doing. And what struck me here was how wonderful these alliterated Ds work here. Dry, dull, dust, dry, discarded. Um, those yes, heavy, heavy D sounds uh, reinforce the, the well, they give you the, <clears throat> almost an onomatopoeic effect of uh, this is this is what the ground um, is like. Annette, did you have some things you'd like us to concentrate on? Um, I was well. I was concerned about the length, and then I was concerned about the ending. If I was being too obvious, you know, coming out and saying what my point was, was I being too obvious? <laughs> And then, you know, I tried to shorten it up. It was longer. And I, I, you know, I did shorten this from what I had from really a free write. But just with that, you know, does, does the point come through? Should I just show it more and not hit you over the head with it at the end? I, my, my personal feeling was that, yeah, the ending, that maybe you said too much in the ending. But why don't we have other people comment particularly on the ending or anything else that they'd like to do um, using the, the, the chat here.
Jen? Yes, I'm here. Do you want to make a confession here? I do. And I heard what you said about taking blame. And I certainly took it in this poem. Confession. I want to tell them about you, Brianna. You who died at 26 from six bullets. But what do I really know about your life in Louisville as a black woman? The only life I understand is mine. The layered life of a farmer's daughter who never thought about her whiteness when she fed alfalfa to Holsteins or showed Chester white pigs at the fair. And now I am an old woman who can't defend what she didn't know and has little time left to understand any part of how it feels to be black. Yes. Um, again, having this array of poems gives us so many techniques and strategies to use in our own poems. Here you are talking directly to someone uh, and that kind of direct address is a strategy um, to add to our repertoire. Um, the embedding, as I was talking about it last time, usually came first. First you say who, something about yourself as speaker and where you're coming from and how this affects you. Um, here that's the middle paragraph or the middle stanza, excuse me. Um, and, and again, that's a nice alternative to have as a strategy. And in these five lines, I think we get the specifics that tell us a lot about the speaker, um, all conveyed through these very concrete images. Um, Chester, white pigs at the fair, really, really brings you right up close to the speaker's situation. Um, the confession at the end, uh, has, has the effect for me of, um, of being a statement of great understanding. First of all, to understand that, that there is a difference um, because a lot of times when people talk about racial issues, it's, well, aren't we all just the same? Well, no, we come from different backgrounds and that makes a a big difference a lot of times. So um, I, I thought in these um, 13 lines, a lot, a lot of uh, very valuable stuff happened. Jen, anything you want us to pay attention to here? Um, well, some, some people will know that this, poem I was in the newsletter and I've been not well for like six, almost six months. So I kind of pulled this one up and, I, and I'd wondered if the last stanza was strong enough because I didn't want it to sound like, I, I don't have any time for understanding hobbies to be black. I didn't want it to be that at all. I wanted it to mean, good God, I, now I finally get it and I have hardly any time to apply what I know. So I guess I would want people to comment on whether it comes off as, I'm just sorry I didn't get it faster, as opposed to don't bother me because I'm old. Yes, okay, and we will comment on that Thank in you. the chat. Thank you. And I think I've already said that I think it has exactly the effect that you described, but, but you want other opinions as well. Thank you, Margaret. Hi, I made it. Hey. Lucy? Yes. I made it. Hey, would you like to read your poem? Yes, thank you. 
Mine's from Grandmother's Inc. I love community theater, especially acting. Making a character come alive makes me come alive. In our summer ensemble dress rehearsal, I am relishing being on stage. I'm flaunting my talent. Chevron says to my character, Connie, women like you always wanna hear a sob story thinking you can save someone. I feel like he is saying it to me, accusing me of being fake. I'm not a sob story. Of course I wanna save someone. I wanna save everyone. Heal the lonely nights of the old souls in care facilities. I want everyone to live in a safe, secure home with enough food to live healthful, energetic lives. Attend an encouraging educational system to the highest degree they strive for. That each child in a for now home is placed in a forever home. Every military vetman, veteran feel empowered by their bravery acknowledged by community support. Each citizen who turns to the healthcare system for help gets help. Back on script, I sneer, try me. Um, I, I loved getting to that last line. <laughs> Uh, the structure of this poem is a lot like the structure of Boogie Woogie, which I think we looked at last time, uh, where the speaker is asked how to spell the word Boogie Woogie, and then has all this reflection and then comes back and, um, and just says, well, it's spelled like you say it. Uh, so it has that framework kind of structure. Um, one of the things that I especially wanted to point out here is what you do with line lengths, because I get that question a lot, like how do I know when to break a line and begin a new line? And one of the um, reasons to do that is um, if you can increase the, the meaning uh, mm -hmm. or, and I think you do that here. Thanks. You have that enjambment across stanzas, uh -huh. every military veteran feel empowered by their bravery. And that's a statement in itself. So you let it stand by a statement in itself. And then there's this other point. And the other point becomes emphasized because it does stand by itself rather than be immediately attached to their bravery, acknowledged by community support. Um, so I, I thought you were working with your line lengths very well. Would you like us to pay attention to some other aspect of the poem? No, whatever you think. Okay, well, why don't we ask everybody to, to throw in their thoughts about this? Um, I already had a comment that it is my style, <laughs> my voice. Oh, thanks, Christy. Hey, always good to get a variety of comments. People notice different things, and um, so that helps uh, get a fuller read on the poem and what and how people respond to your poem, even when we have to hurry along like we are. And hey. will take us to the next poem here. And maybe we're not hurrying along enough. Joe, will you read, reviewing the footage? Um, I have one, uh, two technical notes first. First, my Zoom screen just crashed during the previous conversation. So, and uh, the, we're, the meeting is locked, so I can't actually see anything. Um, and the other technical note is there's a stanza break that got lost in cyberspace. 
So after one, two, three, um, stanza four, uh, the line that begins with grieving, there should be a stanza break right after that. Um, before stanza watching. break comes after sash and before watching? Yes. Okay. There it is. Okay. Um, reviewing the footage, 1985. Whirring from a battered fan nudges the air, soft waves above the woven floor mat, quiet rattles from old metal blades. A TV propped on the lone table shows videoed monks draped in orange, chanting and funerary rituals. Bridges from Thailand's tented camps crossing to urban Honolulu. The wife of the deceased watches herself on screen, praying over joss stick offerings beneath stained glass, aged beauty weathered by exposure, grieving in white lace and sash. Watching today in work blouse and everyday sarong, dressed for the fields of public housing, dressed for Southeast Asia. Her curved back resting against the painted cinder block wall, her daughter beside her translating Laotian, grasping an ancient culture of knowledge and clarity, lost but not lost. Another ending that struck me as being just right, the paradox of something lost but not lost. Um, uh, wonderful details in, in here. Uh, we get a picture of the situation we're in with things with details like battered fan, old metal blades, lone table. Does the, a couple of adjectives paint a picture of, of where we are um, socioeconomically? Um, and the line, the wife of the deceased watches herself on screen, uh, very aptly describes uh, the, the, the time frame, the double time that we're dealing with here. Is there something you'd like us to pay particular attention to? Well, one just technical uh, dress for Southeast Asia. I wondered about change, having it say dressed for home instead, um, or if that would lose some meaning. Um, but also, was it clear that uh, you know this was about displacement, uh, the effects of displacement on peoples, and and trying to maintain your own your cultural life and things that are important uh, to you when you're thousands of miles away from where you could do it. And this actually describes a real situation of a documentary that I had done, and then we showed the footage to the family afterwards, and they commented on it. It came through real clearly for me, but, but let's hear from others in the chat. <laughs> My apologies, but again, if there is anything in the chat, I can't see it. You can't see the comments in the chat? No, my Zoom crashed right at the end of the last Oh, oh okay. Well, we can send them to you um, by email afterward, okay? Great. Thank okay. you. And Peggy. The choice. On our daily walk, we discover a new neighborhood in the maze of cools de sac, where tall trees sway and shelter their owners' homes with privacy and quiet. It's early spring, the wind chaps our stinging cheeks. We admire a yard of snowdrops, expect the daffodils to bloom next week. It's hard to navigate 
this well-defended place, unsettling to seek a way out, thwarted as we are by garden walls, dead ends, million dollar houses set at angles. If we lived here, would we ever again greet a cluster of children at the bus stop who shudder in their parkas as the wind whistles unimpeded from Lake Michigan? Would we ever again stroll past the cedar barricade that hides the trailer park and wonder at the loose aluminum window frames, the trash tossed between units? If we lived in this forested landscape, would we ever again see a street person trudge in front of our house, pushing a Pekingese in a stroller, lugging a garbage bag of belongings? Or would we simply watch the snow deepen around our fortress, savor imported coffee, bask in our scenery, and congratulate ourselves on our contentment? Another poem with really wonderful specific details, and maybe the one that I want to highlight is the Pekingese and the stroller. This is not a, a generic homeless person. This is very specific and, and really uh, very visible, very um, poignant. Um, you also have uh, uh, the musical quality here. I noticed it, especially with the, uh, the wind chaps are stinging cheeks. Those CH sounds uh, work very well. And you also have a concentration of Ds with defended, uh, thwarted, garden, dead ends, dollar houses. It, they're not as they're not always at the beginnings of words, so they're a little more subtle. Uh, but again, they um, have this effect of pulling down uh, uh, the description of, of making it seem hard, hardened. Do you have things you'd like us to concentrate on? Well, I guess I. You know, I think the line endings are just a little awkward for reading, and, <laughs> and I guess it would be kind of hard for people to help me with that, but that's kind of how I felt about it, and, you know, the shape of it, and um, how, you know, you want, I want a shorter poem, and sometimes I think the line endings kind of got a little on, out of hand, that's, so I, I, I think that might be hard to address, but that's really my question. <laughs> Okay. Um, about line, the only thing that I wanted to do in terms of where something ended was I wanted the snow, which is potentially a rich symbol, to be at the very end of the poem. Uh, but thank you for telling us what you're concerned about, and people can comment in the chat. Lucy, Terrell, Terrell, Terrell. Women water walkers. Yeah, women water walkers. This summer swelter day, I carry metal pails to the outdoor spigot. Women water walkers walk miles and miles, carry water. Water flows from the open tap into the first bucket. Women water walkers carry copper pails, do not spill a drop. I fill the second bucket, water cold from the deep well. Water, women water walkers speak up for water, women, children, earth. In total, I haul three full buckets to the dog yard in two trips. Native women stand for water rights, for water untainted by fracking, chemicals, gas, oil. 
I pour water among eight pails, walk water to a place, to place a pail for each husky to lap. Native women in ribbon skirts carry water to protect earth for the seventh generation. What if a hard steel ribbon of tar sands crude cross my land, your land? What if a pipeline rupture meant spills seeped into our wells, into Lake Superior? Women water walkers walk for water rights, sovereignty, native rights, their bodies. Okay, um, it always, I find it fascinating that in any um, submission of poems, there are always a, at least a couple that reverberate very well with each other. So yours and Annette's uh, with the carrying of the water um, if I were editing a, a, a journal uh, issue, I would want both of those um, in, in there to play off against each other, to coordinate with each other uh, in, in the consecutive pages of, of a journal. Uh, and I think realizing something like that helps when you are um, when you send something in for publication and it doesn't get it accepted, it might be because there was another poem that was a better match to a poem um, and has nothing to do with the quality of your poem. Um, Lucy, is there something you wanted us to concentrate on in particular here? I don't think so. I, I, I think I always wonder and in particular in this political context, whether if we talk about problems or issues that aren't our own, what is the right way to do that? So we're not offending, but we're supporting. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and I, I think one way, to, one, one way to do that is to be sure that um, that however the uh, people involved are described, uh, that you're witnessing rather than experiencing yourself, uh, that you honor their specifics rather than work in terms of general impressions or stereotypes. Um, so one thing that I wondered here is uh, because there have been recent, uh, this has been, you're talking here about a recent event, right? Or an ongoing current event. And, and so I felt the, like naming the specifics would, uh, would work here. Uh, so Native women stand for water rights, uh, Native women fighting for, against the construction of line three or Ojibwe women or um, you, there are places in the poem where you could name the specific issue, and I wouldn't shy away from doing that. One of the things that I had in there first was talking about the water protectors that include both men and women at Standing Rock, and then it seemed like it was mixing too many things together, but the, the walks that I think happen every year um, I could be specific in terms of mentioning Ojibwe or, as you say, um, what pipeline or, or um, some of the places on the route that they walk. They specifically don't want white women to go with them. Okay. Other comments for Lucy? Please use the chat. Margaret, you could skip me and go to the next one so we're, we stay on time a little bit more. Yeah, I, I'm terrible at keeping time. I should That's have okay. warned you about that. That's okay. Um, Sarah? Is Sarah here? Yep, I'm here. Okay. 
Can you hear it, the wailing? A friend dropped off the other day a basket, a tidy arrangement of cloves, an orange, three fat cinnamon sticks, meant for simmering on the idle stove. And yesterday I listened to the radio in a patient line, the library's drive through packed with people hankering for books. Tonight it was the takeout, two bags placed like careful gifts on the stony stoop next to this morning's newspaper, still in its plastic bag. We unpacked the food, throwing out the utensils we hadn't ordered, such waste in plenty. Our plates were full, and then our bodies, and the sink was cluttered with all we did not eat. Meanwhile, knees are still on necks, nine minutes a lifetime, and feet, they blister from the friction of protest. Lost friends huddle sodden, hatless on the freezing streets, and always behind steel bars languish the piling skeletons, full of gasp and bleed. Their seers circled round blue screens, the other side of freedom, insouciant, twirling jagged keys, pretending hollow halls aren't teeming with the stench of souls denied their redemption. Just another place where the alliteration is really wonderful. Um, One of the things that struck me here was the waste in the um, section describing uh, the situation that you're speaking from. Um, the takeout includes utensils that you don't want. Uh, there's food left over. Um, so it seems to me that the idea of waste is uh, implicit and made explicit in some details in the first part. And then the second part, the waste um, with the piling skeletons full of gasp and bleed, and that's such a powerful phrase there, uh, becomes much more intense. One, uh, sort of minor point here is, is it the stench of souls or is it the stench of denial? And so I just wondered about maybe taking of souls out of that last line. Would you like everyone to comment on some particular aspect of your poem? Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I guess I part of what I'm not sure about um, is whether the first part seems um, like for me, this was really how it unfolded. Um, much like I can't remember who spoke earlier, maybe Angie was talking about stream of consciousness kind of with the recipe. Um, and I, this is, that's kind of how this poem unfolded. So I'm wondering if like the first section where I was experiencing things, if those things all sound too trivial and not really enough of a justification for the intense realities of the last part, or like if it just all seems too trivial and too minor, um, those things that are mentioned and not necessarily like, oh, what a great life versus, oh, what terrible lives, you know? Um, so I don't know if that may even make sense what a voice there. All right, I, I, I think it's um, a point worth commenting on. I totally get what you're saying. Um, You know, you choose not to alternate, you choose to do two big chunks and that, that might be part of uh, what's going on here. The meanwhiles could be interspersed, mm -hmm. um, but, but you might still have the same, same concern. Uh, so why don't we ask people to comment on that in the chat?
And then Lynn, family tree. Yes, this is just a short poem I wrote during the last class. Family tree. In the blue room, a tree blooms on the opposite wall, colored leaves suspended on brown branches, and my very white family, fathers, mothers, in-laws, outlaws, veterans, peace seekers, immigrants all, all blossoming on their appropriate branches, representing our complex DNA, sprung from common African ancestors, from Adam and Eve on the banks of the Euphrates, now gathered in the central trunk of you and me and us. I, I love the insertion of outlaws in here. Just that one word gives a sense of the variety in the family. Um, and the other thing that I noticed was the concentration of color in the beginning lines um, and, and then not so much color, uh, in fact, ex except in so far as you might imagine the, um, the trunk of the tree to be a certain color, but there's no explicit reference to color in, in the end. Um, And that might be part of what the poem is about. Um, but I have a, I, I, I'd like to come back to that blue room in the poem or another room in the poem. Begins with that blue room. I'm intrigued by that blue room. I'd like to see it again. Anything else uh, you'd like us to concentrate on? Um, I don't know. I, I really was shooting for something. Uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, critical race theory because I work with school districts and it is a hot topic right now. Um, so really thinking about that. Um, and the fact that people that are arguing against it don't know what it is. So... Uh, I don't, yeah, I, I think that there were, were very tiny allusions to it, but probably something I'd like to work more in. Okay. So please make your suggestions to Lynn in the chat. Stephen, you've been waiting patiently. And here we are at your poem. I don't know so much about patiently. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep. Resettle. This orange light brights across black windows. Basement walls come together from the outside in. Some river blends, binds the storm to the last time I saw you. Ask the apple from my stand. Grin your English. This loud crying inside me. Dust refuses to settle. Electricity out. Search boats don't know. You, your family were there. Inhabitants at ground level. Lost a voice. They wanted to keep their place above where you slept. A child's child. What good would it do now? Dig out, cleaned out, restored, rented by word of mouth, by US dollars, hand to hand, no documents, no state trouble, one way out. And this, your poem really expanded our range of style uh, in this a collection of poems here. Um, the opening sentences, the opening lines of the poem uh, put us in a place, but put us in a place uh, with some mystery to it or some disconcerting quality about it. Uh, and, and so feeling disoriented at the beginning um, I look for lines to cling to, or lines to, uh, I can 
hold on to like a log in a, in a sea of turmoil. And I find them in Grinier English, which I totally love. Um, I, I can just, well, actually what I do is picture myself trying to speak Spanish and being a little embarrassed about how bad I am at it. So I grin it, uh, but this isn't about me. It's about the situation in the, in the poem. And I, it's a line that says a lot to me. Um, And what we get from that first stanza is some information. We get the, the two people, the you and the, the person who has an apple on his stand um, uh, in the language uh, question there. Um, and the stanza break brings a break in the um, in, in the uh, uh, focus of the poem, the loud crying inside me. So then we know something else about this speaker. And actually, I think that's a real key line, this loud crying inside me. It's how I interpret the poem. The poem is the loud crying inside you, inside the speaker. And, and so it doesn't have the syntactic regularity that it would have if it were something else, if it were uh, speaking in a calmer uh, kind of situation. Stephen, what would you like us to pay attention to? Um, I tend to uh, cut and cut and cut and cut. And sometimes uh, I cut too much. So I'm the only person that really understands. So are there areas in the poem that needs more information? Uh, is there, did I cut out too much? Is it too bare bones? So if, if people would say this line confuses me or can you say right, more right. here, that would be helpful to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Janine, yours is a long one. Yes. Uh, it, it also, uh, well, let me just let you read it. Okay. Um, many of my poems are short and spare. This is not one of them. Hades Child in the Aftershock. Headline, January 15th, 2010. 200,000 fear dead in Haiti. Dear God, I'm here. I'm alive. Here, in the ruptured earth, here, beneath the flattened building. Dear God, it's so dark. I'm trapped here, under rubble. I cannot move. I am calling out. Can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? I am so afraid, so thirsty, so hungry. I cannot feel my legs. Will I be forgotten? Will I be counted among the dead? No, no, I am here. I am alive. Please find me. Is anyone else here? Who else is left? Mama, where are you? Mama, am I alone? Am I alone? Sound, deafening sound, coming closer, closer. Sound of help? Oh no, no, no. In this darkness, I hear the bulldozer open its jaws, scoop up the earth, eat the dead. No, no, do not open your mouth for me. I am here, I'm alive. Can anybody hear me? Will anybody find me? I am here. I am alive. Thirst, thirst, so, so thirsty, so, so tired. I cannot move. So tired. Sleep, sleep. Dear God, it's so, so dark now. When the bulldozer returns, 
when the bulldozer returns, when the bulldozer returns for me, when the bulldozer throws me in an unmarked grave, will anyone search for me? Will anyone find me? Will anyone ever find me? Will anyone claim me? Will anyone remember my name? Will anyone plant a flower for me? Will anyone place a flower on my grave? Will anyone know that I am, that I was, that I once was a beloved child of Haiti? 200,000 if you're dead in Haiti. Shh, shh, Haiti's child. I hear you. Hush, hush. I am Katrina's child, born of Hurricane Fury. No place to call home in my neighborhood of broken houses, my neighborhood of naked trees, trees stripped, stripped of leaves and bark, no shade left in my neighborhood of silent streets, no birds left to sing my song in my neighborhood of stillborn dreams. I know what it's like to be forgotten. I hear you, Hades child. I will not forget you. I will remember your face. I will remember your voice calling through the night. Sleep, child, sleep. If sleep you must, I will remember the storm that brought me, the earth that took you, the world that shook us both. I will pray for you. I will pray for us. I will not forget you. My heart will find you and lay a flower upon your grave. 200,000 fear dead in Haiti. Thank you. Well, when I read this poem for myself, that it was a poem meant to be read aloud, yes. it was meant to be performed. Yes. And um, thank you for doing that for us. Um, a couple of things that, uh, somewhere along the line, I heard a couple of people say, well, I didn't want my poem to get too long. Is my poem too long? I think this poem shows you that you don't have to be afraid of long poems. <laughs> that can be just... The question also came up about speaking in a voice that is very, is different from you, that you're, you're enacting a character that's, that's not you. Um, and again, I think that if you're staying away from stereotypes, if you're being very um, specific and catching the, the rhythm and the um, language that would work for this, now, of course, the, the Haitian child would probably be speaking French or some right. version of French rather than English. So that aside, um, but even, even with some of the repetition, um, when the bulldozer returns, when the bulldozer returns, when the bulldozer returns for me, when the bulldozer throws me in an unmarked grave, the, the repetition twice of the curtailed sentence and then the elongated sentence and then finally getting to the point of saying the grave and, and thus admitting to death um, strikes me as being insightful about the state of someone who is speaking this. Uh, uh, so, the, so you convince me that you are inside this voice. The voice was inside me. It came in a dream. All of this was in a dream, all of this. And I, I was just the scribe. That's happened to me a few times. It absolutely happened this time. I woke and I have, I've got a green pen, a green ink pen, um, and a notebook next, on my nightstand next to my bed. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote and cried and cried and cried. And it, all, it, it came out. That's exactly the way it came out. Um, I think you're getting a lot of comments in, in the chat. Um, this, I'm sort of embarrassed about how I have to bow out of here right away. I'm supposed to be at an, in another Zoom right now, the, <laughs> introducing somebody whose poem oh, I gosh. gave an award to. Oh, my. Oh, God. Um, so I apologize for the rough conclusion here. Your poems are wonderful. Every single one of these poems is wonderful. Uh, and you can work on revisions as you see, see need to do that. But I am so proud to have done this um, event, this workshop that helped me to get to know you and your work. Thank you very much. And Tori, I'm sorry about skipping over you. I do have comments about your poem. And I'll 
talk more about your poem with you one on one if you want to. Um, but I do have to run. Thank yep. you so much, everybody. Thank you, Peggy. Yep. Thank you, thank you, Margaret. So I will just close and let you know that I did tape this. I know some of you um, in, in progress, so I will make the video available. And I will make the comment, the version with Margaret's comments available to everybody also after the fact. So thank, thank you, Tori, for all your hard work. Yeah, well, thank you everybody for uh, playing along. That was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. And we'll do this again. Wonderful. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you so much. I, I'm just so um, almost beside myself that all that happened tonight, all the worlds we inhabited, oh my God, what amazing company, all of you. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting this happen, allowing, bringing it to, to reality. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah, will you have a chance to read us your poem? I'd love to hear you read yours. Do you have time? Oh, I do, but... Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Read your poem. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I will read my poem. Let me. All right. I had it up like a minute ago. Okay. So it's called Vixen. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Okay. I stand at the sink running water into a kettle. A vixen shrieks like a woman in labor. And I think of women who don't want any part of labor, who are already laboring with two young children and a job in the middle of the night, stacking shelves with cans of corn or boxes of cornflakes. We must have boiling for childbirth and outrage and the disinfecting of shelves. The vixen cries and cries, a soul shivering screech that pierces the prospect of early morning, a sound a she fox makes when mating or defending her territory. A body is a territory. Dangerously soon, women in America will lose protection of our bodies. The misogynist said there should be punishment, and that is what we debate across the bellies of the underrepresented, underrepresented, mostly young, mostly brown, mostly poor. Yet the discourse is toppling. Men in bruising suits and lokia colored ties stack the courts, ignoring constituents who support the right to choose, disregarding the health of women without access to contraceptives who cannot afford an unplanned pregnancy. Abortion has a history dating back thousands of years, showing criminalization does not prevent abortion. What a fairy tale. In fact, abortion rates will rise. In fact, women will die. Still, men stamp their feet like Rumpelstiltskin, and we name them for their duplicity. They want our unintended babies, yet they have no qualms about executing inmates. Why is payment always a child in fairy tales? Women are penalized for the capacity to bring life into the world or not. The water finally rises to a temperature and I let the kettle scream and scream. I think you're muted. Hey, Tori, I'm a little bit lost in the context of the vixen. Who is the vixen? Is that is that someone that that the speaker is talking to? Someone that the speaker is talking about? Or is there something I'm missing? Well, you like to you like to delete lines. I also like to delete lines. So the vixen is something heard outside the window. So maybe I need to put that context in. It's a, it's a. That, that, that would help me immensely. 
because okay. I spent I spent the first part of the poem trying to figure out who the vixen is instead of focusing on the you know the the story. Yeah, I can. Well, I I I kind of assumed people have windows by their kitchen sinks, but maybe that's not a connection other people make. So I yes, I could make it more obvious. Well, thank you for indulging me. That was nice. <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it would be too sad to end without having heard you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for indulging me. So anyway, thank you guys for coming. And like I said, we will do this again. And thank you for writing about such a difficult topic. And every, every topic we chose was difficult. But this yeah. was so timely and so difficult. And um, I, I've been listening to an audio um, version of the book about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her tireless work to make sure that women's bodies belong to us and right. watching that being eroded in front of our eyes. Oh my God, it's just beyond heartbreaking. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to go. Home. Good night, everybody. See ya. Good night, everybody. More to Bye. follow. Yay. Thanks, Tori. Good night.